Okay, so before I start going through these slides, I wanted to ask uh, a show of hands, raise your hand if you've used GIS ever in the last three years, let's say. Okay, so there are maybe one third, one fourth of you have used GIS, which makes me feel good about the rest, the two, uh, two thirds or uh, three fourths who have not used GIS. Uh, it's going to be hopefully uh, useful uh, for you this presentation. For those of you who have already used GIS, this will be more of a refresher or you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I, uh, if I don't provide quite the uh, accurate information. Okay, so what is GIS, Geographic Information Systems? Uh, it allows us, um, it's a platform that allows us to um, do analysis that are spatially uh, explicit. So we can um, uh, input st uh, data, store data, edit data, and output uh, data that is geographically re referenced or spatially explicit. And uh, we can manage uh, maps. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the pointer is, uh, is uh, not working, but it's, it's okay. Uh, so we can manage either uh, maps or uh, textual information, uh, meaning uh, attributes table and such, in a single system. So this is the advantage of having GIS, both spatial information and textual information in one, in one system. And now I think I can either have the pointer or the uh, advancing the, through the slides. Okay, so the main data types uh, that are used in uh, uh, any GIS system, uh, they come in two forms, raster format and vector format. And both data types use a georeferencing system or a way of, of figure out where in space our data are um, for, for both raster and uh, vector data. So what I would like to do is go over the two types. So the first type, the raster type of data, um, this is a, a childish representation of the real world, uh, but just for illustrative uh, purposes. So imagine we have this kind of landscape in the real world and then we want to uh, move or convert this real world landscape into a digital uh, landscape in, uh, in a GIS program. So what we want uh, with raster data is represent uh, these features uh, as um, uh, cells in a raster. So for example, uh, here we have some sort of, let's call it some ag land. Um, so these pixels all, uh, these cells all have the same value. Here we have uh, mountains. Uh, notice how they are flat here. And then a river, forest, so on and so forth. So basically, we, it's like, uh, dropping a grid on a real landscape and created, uh, creating a, a digital version of the real uh, world. So that's the raster, uh, the raster uh, option. One now some types of raster, yes, Excuse me. Aladdin. The last photo. Yes. Uh, there is a relation or a correlation between the symbols and the, the mountain and the, the, the other. Yeah. If there is a relationship between um, Mountains here and mountains there, and number of cells, maybe? Is that what you're asking? So the first letter, oh, yes, so this would be yes. mountains, sorry, yes, this would be mountains, forest, it, it is not random. culture, no, it's representing, uh, it's like I said, just like dropping a grid, and then the cells, uh, the values of the cells will represent that particular feature uh, that. Re exist in reality. If it's uh, a mountain, this is a mountain. If it's some crop, crop, uh, yeah, river. Are. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so then uh, some types of data that uh, uh, you will come across if you work in ArcGI uh, ArcGIS, that's what I use. If you work in GIS uh, software, uh, uh, one uh, type of data that we see very often is uh, climate data. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you uh, an example of mean annual temperature. Um, so what we have is just like in the previous slide, but uh, a lot more pixels, we have um, a landscape of pixels or cells with uh, values for, uh, and I think I have some values, zooming in. So zooming in, we see uh, more, uh, small pixels, small cells, and then each cell has, in this case, because I picked uh, mean annual temperature, has um, a value a temperature value for that pixel which corresponds with the temperature value um, at that particular location on the landscape. 
So we have, uh, um, uh, as you see, we have a matrix of cells uh, organized in rows and columns, and each, uh, each cell contains a value. Um, this kind of data, raster data, we see, uh, like I said, for, for climate data, but for example, precipitation, uh, elevation, well, precipitation is part of climate. So that's one, uh, one um, area where uh, raster data is used. Now, when we Google something and we look at uh, an aerial image, think of that aerial image as a raster because it is in reality uh, a, a raster as well. It's uh, uh, cells that have a certain um, hue, uh, color, uh, representing a feature um, in the real world. And land use classes, that's another uh, type of, uh, it's another raster that has cells and uh, the cells are populated with values for each land cover class. Okay, um, now the difference between, one difference between this raster that I showed you mean annual temperature and this raster uh, land use land cover is that we consider this to be continuous values. They are almost continuous, they are not in an infinite number of values, but there are large, large, large numbers of values here. And then categorical values, values is when we have a finite number of uh, va possible uh, values, po finite number of values possible for the pixels. So in this case, we have uh, about 10 values. Uh, we have a land cover classification. So that's why we call it a categorical raster because we have a finite uh, um, a number of a uh, finite number of values available and then for mean annual temperature we have a lot more uh, values and, and that's uh, continuous considered continuous so I have to keep going this way because okay another consideration another point to consider for raster data is resolution so we can represent a uh, think back of the first uh, simple representation of that landscape uh, we can have an entire mountain represented by one pixel or a mountain represented by, I don't know, a thousand pixels or 500 uh, pixels. So that's what we mean by resolution. How, um, how, inform how much information we have uh, in that raster, how uh, detailed the information is. So this is an illustration that I think uh, helps uh, clarify this, um, this uh, concept. So think of a lake, for example. Uh, and we know from measuring it in the, uh, in the field, we know that is, it, it uh, is 71 squared meters. So what we do is we place uh, a grid on top of this, um, on this shape, on, on top of this shape. So now we have the lake represented in, with these small cells. Uh, and in this case, each cell is one meter by one meter. So that's the resolution of, uh, of this raster. If we use this raster, this will have a resolution of one meter. Now we can switch to uh, uh, bigger cells, in this case two meters, or uh, even bigger cells four meters. So what we see is that with increasing the size of the cells, uh, we have less cells representing the same shape. So from one meter to four meters, we, are, uh, we move from uh, 16 by 16 cells to four by four cells representing that same shape. So why is this important? Uh, besides the amount of information represented, it's also important to consider uh, the size of, of the raster. So if we represent a, a lake uh, 16 by 16 cells versus 4 by 4, we'll have a large file versus a small file. So data storage and data processing is heavily affected by the resolution of the raster. So a one meter resolution raster for a province versus a one kilometer resolution for a raster for a province makes a big difference when you analyze data. Also for some types of analysis, you actually don't need that high, high resolution uh, raster. So no need to overload uh, the analysis if you actually, the question you are asking does not require high uh, resolution. So there are um, different um, uh, characteristics here uh, illustrated here. I don't know if I missed anything. Larger file size, da, da, da. I think I did everything here. Okay, um, now the vector, the other main type of representation of real world in digital uh, world in mapping um, has to do with uh, vector uh, data. So here what we are doing, instead of placing a, a grid of a um, uh, agreed with a determined cell size, what we are doing is we are tracing various uh, classes in this case. So we have a square for crop, 
we have some polygon for mountains, for forest, then we have a line for river, and we have a single tree there, so we have a point. So this, in other, in other words, uh, vectors are, are made of points, lines, and polygons. So multiple points, by, li uh, by uh, connecting multiple points, we get lines. By connecting lines, we get uh, polygons. A simple, uh, very simple concept. OK. Now, how is, um, uh, why is this uh, data using, uh, at least for us, for um, biologists, geographers, um, points re represent specific places, uh, lines uh, for, uh, between points form vectors, and then polygons form uh, closed vectors. And these are uh, used to represent um, objects such as occurrence data for a species, for example, and a lake if we have a polygon, a river if we have a, um, a line if we have a river. And to uh, illustrate this briefly, uh, let's think, let's imagine, well not imagine, it's real, this is real data. We have records, museum, uh, herbarium records for this plant. Uh, we map these, uh, these occurrences uh, on a map of um, counties, uh, and I think this, was Kans this is Kansas. So th here's a shapefile that has all those features. It has, well it doesn't have lines, well we can think of lines here, but uh, it has polygons and points. Uh, that represent different uh, features. Points representing occurrence data, polygons representing counties uh, in this case. So why, why are vector data used? Um, they are very useful in uh, um, linking uh, location and shape of an object uh, with uh, attributes of that object. So um, with, uh, with shape files we, op we uh, represent not just a location of an object, but also shape of an object, uh, and we have uh, much more, uh, much more, um, much more information uh, associated with uh, with, ras with uh, polygons as of uh, with the vector as opposed with uh, raster data. Um, yes, that's pretty much what I was trying to say there. Uh, so an example here to, s to show not just the map but also the, the table, the attributes table. This is a, a map of protected areas overlaid on top of um, a map of US. So these are polygons of protected areas in US and the uh, attributes table associated with, with the, um, uh, th this shapefile, so basically the textual information associated with this shapefile, uh, we can see it here, um, area, na uh, name of the area, latitude, longitude, and we can have as many fields as, as we want. Okay, now I said that, um, that um, both uh, raster data and vector uh, data uh, require a georeferencing system or a spatial representation uh, of the location uh, that we see in the real world. And I'm sure everybody knows about the geographic uh, system, uh, geographic coordinate system with latitude, longitude. This is what I'm, I'm showing here. Um, datum is an important um, an important, uh, my slides are a little messed up here. Uh, datum is an important uh, concept because uh, different maps have different datums. So we have to be very careful. Uh, the differences can be uh, minute in terms of just a few meters or can be quite, uh, quite uh, much larger in terms of distance, maybe hundreds of meters. So if you um, use a geographic coordinate system with, let's say, uh, uh, North American datum uh, that was generated in 1927 versus a map with coordinate, with geographic coordinates and a datum that is, for example, World uh, Geodating WGS84, World Geodating System 1984, there will be slight differences, uh, order of meters differences. Uh, it may not matter for the uh, type of analysis you do, but it, if location matters, then uh, this kind of difference uh, you, you definitely have to pay attention to. So datum, uh, always pay, uh, pay attention um, uh, uh, when you use uh, geographic uh, systems, well, georeferencing systems. Okay, now um, going from, geographic, from the latitude, longitude, the geographic coordinate system that you are familiar with, um, going t from um, from uh, Earth from Earth, which is not a flat uh, uh, object, to a flat map requires um, requires a mathematical uh, transformation 
to, to get to that point. So uh, here I'm showing the uh, real location, the latitude and longitude uh, in a, on, a, um, on Earth, and then how that gets transfer transferred on a two-dimensional XY um, axis. So uh, we go from a lat-long system to a Cartesian system to finally a flat map projection. In this case, I'm showing you a Merca Mercator projection. So UTM, universal, uh, what is that? Transverse Mercator. Transverse Mercator. Universal Transverse Mercator is one type of uh, map, a Mercator uh, map projection. So, so what, what you have here is the formula to get from X and Y uh, coordinates, uh, get to a flat, um, basically convert latitude and longitude uh, to a flat map uh, with, uh, with, these, uh, with this formula for uh, x and, and y. Okay, so that's needed because we are going from Earth to a flat representation of locations. Now, this, uh, the um, referencing system or the projection system uh, can become uh, very complicated. I started with uh, UTM zone uh, UTM because I think some of you are familiar have used UTM before. So what we have here is Earth divided into 60 zones, each uh, 6 degrees wide in longitude. And then within each zone, each of these 60 zones, we have a central meridian. And we calculate uh, location based on that uh, distance from that central meridian in, in each uh, zone. Which means that you have to know in which zone the particular region you are working on if you are doing a survey, you need to know the zone um, in order for, for this system to make sense when you are uh, mapping your, um, let's say, your survey points. Okay, um, and then here's an example um, uh, of a location. This is uh, latitude longitude, and this is coordinates, uh, UTM coordinates, so we know that it's zone 15, uh, northern hemisphere. These are details that we need to know if we are, for example, uh, converting latitude and longitude in a GIS system. If we are converting latitude and longitude to a UTM system, maybe we have a, a land cover map that is in UTM and we want to overlay our survey uh, on that land cover map we need those occurrences to be converted to, uh, those coordinates to be converted from latitude longitude to UTM. For that, we need to know the zone in which we, we carried out the survey. So just be um, mindful of these. Now, um, georeferencing systems, and I should have let Bilal talk about this, because he's a, I think, geographer by training, maybe? Um, yes. Yes? I know you don't like labels, so. <laughs> Uh, you, at least uh, this label you agree with. Anyway, so uh, map projections are extremely important, uh, not for just for geographers, but for, for biologists as well. And I hope you will agree with me soon. So we need to know that uh, we cannot do both. We cannot preserve uh, um, shape of the feature and uh, distance, true distance uh, and area uh, for uh, for between features. So we can even ha either have a, a map that preserves the shape that we see maybe from above or a map that pre preserves the true area of that, let's say, a province or a country. So uh, that's the first uh, important point to make. And then we have, based on whether the uh, map projection preserves uh, shape uh, of the feature, we have conformal or um, equal area projection if the projection uh, preserves the area of the feature. Okay, there is more stuff. Um, so these map projections are based on the, uh, the flat map and how we, how we wrap that flat map around the Earth. So we can have uh, cylindrical, planar, we are sectioning the Earth, or we have conic projections. We don't have to worry about all these things. I'm just putting them up here for you to be aware of the complexity of map projections. When you download data, chances are they will not be in the same uh, map projection. So you have to be aware of all these uh, different types of uh, map projections. But I'm not going to explain them in detail. OK. So we are all, I'm, I'm sure all of you who have worked in GIS have seen uh, a map that has as the coordinate system a, a latitude and geographic coordinates, latitude and longitude. We actually call that, or geographers actually call that an unprojected map. 
Um, and then um, for, for these unprojected maps that show latitude and longitude uh, in, uh, coordinate, in geographic coordinate systems, um, they do distort, th they don't preserve the uh, shape, uh, they don't preserve the, the distance, so it's not, it's not uh, conformal n uh, and it's not an equal area projection. It's just showing uh, geographic coordinates. Um, the only correct distance is uh, uh, between points and equator. Yes, yes. So going uh, in latitude, that is the correct, uh, uh, correct distance. Okay, so I'm showing you an unprojected map of United States. Um, those of you who are familiar with this, the shape of United States, this is not, it's a flat shape, it's not pretty. Uh, this is more, uh, this is a shape that uh, resembles more United States when we look uh, at United States from say space. So this is unprojected, this is uh, conformal conic projection. Okay, so if you don't care about map projections, it's bad <laughs> because if you uh, happen at one point in time, if you happen to do an analysis that, that require measuring distances or, or areas and you use an unprojected map like a, a geographic uh, coordinate uh, map or you use a map that pre uh, preserves uh, the nice shape of that region, you are not uh, uh, doing a correct measurement of area or distances. So don't, never, never measure distances, never measure areas unless you have an equal area projection map. So you need to make sure that your map has an equal area projection for these types of analysis. And this is my last slide, um, ArcGIS still rules the world, I'm sorry, uh, but then there, there is a lot of uh, freeware, uh, Diva GIS, Quantum GIS, you dig. I don't dig, you dig, but maybe you will dig, you dig. I'm um, just playing with words here. Uh, I'm learning Quantum GIS and it's, it's a little bit of a struggle for me because I've been using Ar ArcGIS for many, many years and I'm very comfortable with ArcGIS, but it's expensive software. So I think that's the last slide I have and Bilal will follow up, yes. Yeah, just a quick point can get a free one-year license of RTAS um, that is not connected to a network, so that's all freely available. For one year, you can download, uh, you can use RTAS. And uh, the makers of RTAS, um, a company called the Environmental Systems Research Institute, will sometimes offer bulk discounts to developing nations or developing institutions for use in that, but we also want to try and encourage open source use that doesn't necessarily go through companies. Oh, Bilal just said that, but please turn around. Oh. He's wearing an Elsevier t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'll actually argue against ARC, because no. those, those scholarships that they give that are uh, you know, free copies of the software to people in developing countries frequently are given by the international office and then not actually handed over by the national office. I've heard people from 10 countries around the world saying that they were awarded the scholarship and then the national office wanted a payment of 25%, something like that. But just to give you an idea of the dimensions of the costs of this software, uh, to equip my lab with ArcGIS, I pay $4,000 per year and have for the last, what, 15 years. Um, I get it for free at Oklahoma State University. No, you don't. <laughs> I you, don't pay for it. You get it at Oklahoma State University because Oklahoma State University paid a ton of money. But they didn't make me pay for it. Right. So. But, but see, that's, that's the Elsevier myth. That's a dependency situation. You know, <laughs> Lee, yeah. Lee goes to his office at UC Santa Barbara, and all of those papers in Elsevier Elsevier is a big journal publisher, like 3,000 plus journals. All those papers look like they're free. Lee, do you hum know how much UC Santa Barbara pays per year for library access? I can't comment because I actually haven't looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the University of Kansas pays $4.5 million per year for electronic access to journals. And there's still plenty we don't have access to. And we don't have access to everything and What's more, Elsevier and, their, and the like, I shouldn't pick just on Elsevier, but I will for today, have been raising the prices 12% per year for the past 30 years. Completely unsustainable. 
back to GIS systems, ARC is extremely expensive. Yes, it's very versatile. Mona, I, I agree with you that it's, it's it an makes incredible my life tool. easy and... But QGIS is makes my open life source. QGIS is participatory. It's free. It's growing. Just in the last, you know, from version 2.0 to 2.12 where they are right now, the functionality has gotten much, much better. So you all have two options. You know darn well you can go to the market, right, wherever they sell yeah, cracked software. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> At one point, Kristalka said, can I say shit on YouTube? And I said, well, you just did. <laughs> so uh, you can go to the market and buy a cracked version. And you'll get probably 90% of functionality, and that's fine. And everybody does it. I've done it. Okay. Everybody does. Please edit this out. Why? <laughs> this happens. If they want to sue me, they can. I'm not saying you've done it. I have never done it. There you honestly. go. Honestly. I have. I have. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm honest. <laughs> 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 and you're wearing their, their advertisement <laughs> as a result. Um, so that's certainly one option. I actually would suggest strongly that people invest in the honest tool which is community built, free, open source, and is building and improving. Just my editorial, but I couldn't resist. Any questions about, I forgot to ask if you had any questions about the raster format or the vector format, map projections, UTM. It was just a quick, yes. Sorry, I need to get to you. It's okay. Yeah, you, you've uh, warned us against uh, the data that we download. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, like uh, those of us who often get data from GBIF and other sources, uh, can we be sure to download and use directly? Or do you know if GBIF insists on some form of whatever, the kind of data yes. and the formats that they use? So I, uh, the question is about um, you, when you go to GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and you download occurrence data for a species, uh, can you uh, use it directly and in an automated mode, uh, safely thinking its geographic coordinates? I don't think so. I think you should be checking to make sure that it's not UTM or, or other uh, sources, but, or other map projections. Sorry, this is going to be a close-up. Uh, <laughs> Um, the GBIF data, and in fact, any other data that you find have a lot of complications, okay? One is certainly the quality, source, provenance, and details of the geographic information. Just to give you one detail, GBIF does give us one crucial field, which is the uncertainty associated with a latitude-longitude coordinate. So you get a coordinate that says this place on the surface of the Earth. Is this place with a footprint of one millimeter by one millimeter, or one kilometer by one kilometer, or 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers? And that, that information is part of the international standard protocols for georeferencing and for documenting georeferencing. And yet GBIF in particular does not serve that information. So it's very difficult to use data directly from GBIF. But if we back up a step, there's an information standard called Darwin Core. And Darwin Core includes all of those fields. Okay? Um, and that, that information standard, when it is served completely, allows us to do that sort of evaluation of the quality of the georeferencing. If you download GBIF data now, you will automatically be given to Excel, or if you request Excel, there will give you two files. One's going to be more of the basic information, your lat long species name, blah, blah, blah. They will give you another one that's all of the Darwin Core data that they have for, or at least, I don't know if it's all of it, but it's a vast majority. It's a huge file. So 
the only it's way to dollars. get the only way to get the the coordinate uncertainty in meters, which a lot of us would consider to be absolutely crucial for doing this work, is to go all the way back to the verbatim data file, which is essentially what they're getting from each source. So that's something that will hopefully be corrected soon. But for example, you can get data from VertNet and you do get all of the Darwin core fields. But there are a whole bunch of other problems because all that the Darwin core is and all that all of these data portals are is a flow through of information from the source. You don't necessarily know if the person who assigned those latitude longitude coordinates was you know, falling asleep or thought that Benin City is in Benin. It's not. Um, or was using outdated maps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so as we've dealt with in other BITC courses, there's a whole set of protocols for cleaning data. And if you can't clean data, you should at least be able to flag certain records as having a high pri probability of holding errors, okay? So I personally do not believe in automated processing of large numbers of species without some individual inspection at various points in the process. If you wanna do all 1.9 million species that are in GBIF right now, or all you know, 600 species of birds across Kenya, you can, but there's going to be a lot of noise coming in with the signal. That's the problem, okay? Much better is to work, I believe, at smaller scales, one species at a time, a few or a hundred species at a time. The data will be cleaner, the modeling can be done much better, and so the products will be better. Because otherwise it just becomes a garbage in, garbage out phenomenon. Okay? Question is, how come no one is talking about it? There's actually a lot of discussion about that. Um, there are perhaps 10 recent papers that basically say, GBIF data aren't good enough to use. And I actually disagree with that also, okay? The data are there, there is signal in the noise, but you have to use techniques that are appropriate to those, that kind of data which has noise in it. And that often involves hand data inspection, data cleaning, it's laborious, and no, you can't do the 600 species at a time in an afternoon. It might take a year, okay? Which is to say we have tons of data but we really have to approach them carefully and intelligently still.